welcome back. Today's talk is going to be all about managing the type 2 diabetic, particularly meds and screening. The information provided here is geared towards helping you to better prepare for your nurse practitioner board's exam. However, I do believe that this information could be equally beneficial to the nursing student as well. I recently passed my nurse practitioner board's exam. The topic of diabetes was heavily focused on as managing diabetes patients is a huge part of working in primary care. Diabetes meds for me were difficult to get a grasp on, and I had a hard time with uh, remembering the names. So because of that, I came up with some tricks to help me remember them, and I shared those on the last slide here. The last slide is a dump sheet um, I made up of all of the diabetes meds I will talk about, particularly in this PowerPoint, aside from insulin. And then on that dump sheet, besides tricks to help remembering them, are also key points to remember as well. Dump sheets were, it's such a weird thing to say, but dump sheets were something that I used a lot in my studies, um, specifically for my exam. They helped me to remember like clinical pearls. So if that's something that you like or if it's help, helpful for you, then just let me know. And then if there is a topic that you would be interested in having like a quote unquote dump sheet made of, then go ahead and leave it in the comments below and I'd be happy to try and make one for you or for everybody, I guess, myself included. As I said, I love doing these because I learn a lot as well. A quick side note, all the white slides that are included, those are strictly discussing dosing and they're not important for studying for your boards. So majority of the slides you'll see are black, um, but for those white ones, I, I just separated those. So you'll know that those are not really something that you should be focusing on for your boards. You have to really focus on and worry about. However, if you want to be familiar with one, I guess I'd recommend being familiar with the dosing of metformin. I simply included those just to help myself, like I said, but also you, the listener, of course, as well, just to help get familiar with the usual dosages. So also, if you like what I do, enjoy studying with me, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel so that I can continue to make this kind of content. So yeah, let's get into diabetes medications. So this first slide here is all about the di diagnostic criteria for diabetes. I put this here for reference. And what I did to remember these numbers is I s simply remembered the pre-diabetes numbers. And then anything higher than those would fall in the type 2 category. So that's just how I remembered it. I found it a lot um, more helpful. But like I said in another video of mine, AANP does provide you with all the normal values. So, but still I think it's really important to have a good grasp of just the diagnostic criteria because you're gonna be treating so many diabetic patients. So for pre-diabetes, A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Above that 6.4 is type two diabetic. Pre-diabetes for fasting plasma glucose, is a result of 100 to 125. So if the patient is fasting and their plasma glucose is above 125, then that is indicative of type 2 diabetes. And then for the oral glucose, oral glucose tolerance test for prediabetes, um, the results would be 140 to 199. And then above that 199 reading for the oral glucose tolerance test would be indicative of type 2 diabetes. So yeah, and then a random blood glucose greater than 200 with any symptoms of diabetes, any of those three Ps, we all should know them, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, any of those, and then that indicates type 2 diabetes as well. So yeah, helpful tip, just remember those pre-diabetic numbers for your reference and then everything higher than that is gonna be your type two diabetics. So what are our A1C goals for our patients? Because they're not gonna be the same for everyone. I included them here, but you can read them. A1C less than 6%, we're gonna want for most of our pregnant patients. An A1C of less than 6.5 for most of our type one diabetics. An A1C less than 7% for most adults. An A1C less than 7%, 7.5% for those healthy but older adults, and then an A1C less than 8 to 8.5% for the older adults with those comorbidities. So you can see that we get 
less and less strict and stringent dependent on the population. Um, patients presenting with an A1C greater than 7.5% should begin medication. The text did say unless the patient appears to be highly motivated, able to identify like mod modifi modifiable factors, and really looking to make dramatic changes in their life, then you can trial um, reducing their A1C without medication for about three to six months. But really that's gonna depend on the individual patient. Generally speaking though, A1C greater than 7.5% warrants medication. And then those patients, this really pertains to everybody, but um, those diabetic patients with a BMI greater than 25, we really wanna be emphasizing also those lifestyle modifications Weight loss, healthy eating habits, and exercise are huge for managing diabetes in the entire diabetic population. So the first diabetic medication discussed should be, and obviously is metformin, which is a biguanide, and these start at a 500 milligram a day dose. I remember, this is kind of funny, but in my head, big and wide or big old guy metformin, big and wide, yeah. Okay, oh, that's so funny. Um, so that's gonna decrease the A1C by one to 2%, so it's extremely effective in bringing down those numbers. And there's a lot of benefits to starting our patients on metformin. There has been shown to be either no change in weight or even possible weight loss. Um, does not cause hypoglycemia, and that's because the mechanism of action is that the liver, um, that the drug decreases the liver's output of glucose. So that is a, that explains why hypoglycemia isn't a concern. It's reducing the output of glucose. And then also this drug could reduce cardiovascular events. And some of the literature even states that it could possibly reduce cancer. It is contraindicated in all those patients at risk of lacto lactic acidosis. And renal insufficiency is going to be one big issue that we're looking out for, as those patients are more predisposed. Wow, well, I can't talk today. Predipo predisposed to lactic acidosis. So a GFR less than 30 is going to be contraindicated in the use of metformin, as well as severe liver dysfunction, active alcohol abuse, and then decreased tissue perfusion and or hemodynamic instability. The older elderly patients, those patients are gonna be even at more increased risk for lactic acidosis because with age, they have more increased risk of kidney-related complications. Um, GI side effects are going to be the most common side effect that patients experience with taking metformin. And if they, specifically diarrhea, and so if the patient begins experiencing diarrhea, then text recommends that you stop metformin until the diarrhea stops. And once it stops, start them back on metformin, but low and slow. So if you need to cut the dose in half, if you need to titrate over weeks, whatever it is that you need to do to keep your patient on metformin, up to date, and all of the other text recommends to do what you can to keep them on the drug and that it is just so beneficial. So like I said in the beginning here, this is one of the first like white slides that discusses just dosing only, and you don't really need to heavily focus on these for your boards. If you're gonna really read any of these in preparation for boards, I recommend the metformin. Otherwise, these are simply there for your reference, mine included, and I just think that they're, it's nice to get familiar with the normal dosages. So this one will be like the only dosing that I'll really read over. The rest of them you can just look at yourself. But metformin, prior to starting it, we should be checking the serum, creatinine, and GFR, the liver function test, and the A1C. And then there's a 500, 850, or 1,000 milligram tabs available. We'll and the patient will take those with meals twice a day. And then there's some ranges here dependent on GFR that you can look at. And then also there is an extended release um, option for metformin and those are taken once daily and those are available in 500 and 750 milligram tabs and then also there's a 500 milligram suspension available. 
And some of the research now is saying that those extended release tabs have been shown to have slightly less GI side effects. So if our patients really aren't tolerating their metformin, we can definitely try an extended release version and see if the side effects are more tolerable for them. So for the majority of patients, if the goal of a the goal A1C isn't reached within the first three months of metformin and lifestyle modifications, then it's going to be recommended that we add on a second agent, either another oral drug or an injection. And this is when we get into all those fun, the DPP4, GLP1, SGLT, all the ones that I kind of struggled with and I know a lot of other people I've heard struggle with as well. So hopefully the next slides will help break them down a little bit more, make them a little easier to understand and remember. Of course, when we're choosing a second agent for our patients, these need to be based on our individual patient health history. So specifically, we're going to be factoring in things like cardiovascular disease, heart failure, chronic kidney disease. All, all of these are going to play a role in what we decide to put our patient on. And so how do we go about choosing our second agent? Let's see. Quickly before we dive into each medication class individually, there is a graph here that I put together. I gathered the information from up to date and I organized it in a way to show you the drugs and which ones decrease A1C the most. So starting at the top of the SGLT2 inhibitors, that's the, the least reduction on this scale here, although the beginning there are pretty relatively similar up into insulin, which of course we can reduce up to 3.5% A1C, so that's gonna be the biggest reduction there. And then I included advantages and disadvantages of the drugs. And now we'll go through these individually and we'll touch on all of these topics, but I definitely recommend reviewing this graph and just kind of getting familiar with the information here as in a nutshell, really gonna be beneficial for you in your studying for boards. So the next drug class that we're going to discuss are the SGLT2 inhibitors. And a phrase that I came up with in my mind and that helped me remember the drugs and their names was she goes with the flows. Um, the she goes with the flows. The S and the G makes me think of the she goes. And then the flows is spelled F-L-O-Z. Not an accident, not because I can't spell, although I'm not the best sometimes, but because the all of the drugs have those letters in them. So it's, oh God, I'm not, I shouldn't even attempt to saying these, but for example, canaglivlozin. Okay, but she goes with the flows. That's your SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, typically, you're going to take these drugs one time, one time a day before the first meal of the day. Benefits to them include possible weight loss, possible reduced risk of cardiac event, and then also possibly renal protective for our patients, which we know is huge on these meds. It is contraindicated in patients with prior DKA and then also a GFR less than 45 and these specific medications, and then less than 30 for the canaglovlozin. My goodness, those are hard. Um, so just be, be cognizant of patients' GFRs before starting them on diabetic meds. There is an increased risk of UTI, yeast infections, and fractures. So if our patient is at increased, bone, increased risk for bone fractures, it might you know, benefit us to get a bone density test and just factor in these before choosing these meds. And then at the end, at the end here, I just included that UpToDate recommends that if our patient has a history of cardiovascular disease, then the empagliflozin is what they recommend for that patient demographic. All right, and then as I promised, your next slide is going to be all about dosing. I'm not going to read these. I'm going to let you look at them for your reference because they're not going to be focused on on your boards, but I think they're really important to be familiar with. And for going into practice as a new NP, I know that I really need to educate myself on this and be familiar with this. So, and you as well as you are entering into your new practice. I did want to note really quick that if you look on these slides as well, I didn't mention it in the previous one, but I put up there 
This is $450 a month. These diabetic medications are like ridiculously expensive. It is such an expensive disease and just something that we should keep in the back of our mind when we're working with our patients that this might not be the most cost effective thing for them and so they might not end up taking their meds at all because they can't afford them. I've seen that countless times in the ER. It happens all the time, not necessarily because they're, they're not necessarily non-compliant because they just don't want to take their meds. A lot of times they can't afford them. So as providers, we need to be thinking about that as well. Our next drug class is the DPP4 inhibitors. That is the citagliptins, saxagliptin, linagliptin, all of them have the letters or the word in it, LIP, L-I-P. That's what stuck out to me in my mind. So I came up with the saying in my head, don't fall for duck lips. I don't know why. I think the duck was because the DPP, it made me think of don't fall for the four in their duck lips. Um, and then I kind of like interplayed the word fail and fall in my mind don't fail for duck lips just because these drugs you really want to avoid in our heart failure patients. Kind of silly, but it did help me. Maybe it'll help you. So yeah, DPP4, don't fall for duck lips. <laughs> it is an oral medication again, and it can be considered for monotherapy if the patient is unable to take metformin. Of course, that's our first line. And then it can also be used to add on to metformin or another therapy. If we are going to be choosing the DPP-4, then again, there's a high risk with patients with CHF and it's warned against using it. I didn't see that it was contraindicated, but that to me that says don't use it with CHF patients. Um, if we're choosing the DPP-4s because the patient has chronic kidney disease and they have a GFR less than 30, then UpToDate has a recommendation for us, and that is to use the linagliptin as the drug because it's eliminated mostly through the, through the hepatic system, so it, it won't be as harsh on our kidneys. And then we'll check creatinine prior to starting the drug, and then every three to six months for a GFR less than 45 or every six to 12 months for a GFR if it's above 45. And then there are some adverse effects that include headache, nasal pharyngitis, upper respiratory infection symptoms, GI side effects are predominantly seen with acetagliptin. But yeah, there's your DPP-4s in a nutshell. And then here is the dosing for the DPP-4 inhibitors for your reference. Our next drug class is the thiazolidine dones. It is a mouthful, but in my mind, the way that I remember these medications, I kind of said like this little phrase, I said, thiazolidine dione is in the no heart failure zone. Um, all of the drugs end in zone, and they are contraindicated in heart failure. Thiazolidine dione is in the no heart failure zone. So it is rosaglitazone, pioglitazone. This drug class is second, even third line. So for pioglitazone, it can be used as a monotherapy if the other PO agents are contraindicated, like metformin, of course, and then also if that patient doesn't want to have injections and a DPP-4 or SGL-2 are just too expensive for the patient. These are, op these are reasons why we might use a pioglitazone as monotherapy. Um, it's contraindicated. The whole class is contraindicated in heart failure, history of fractures, active liver disease, active or a history of bladder cancer, type 1 diabetes, obviously, in pregnancy. And then so liver function tests should be monitored and then measured prior to starting. And then there's also it carries a risk of weight gain, heart failure, fracture, possible increase in bladder cancer, which explains why all of those are contraindications in this drug class. And then here is the thiazolidine dione dosing for your reference. The next drug class is the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And those all end in the word TIDE, T-I-D-E. So in my mind, I remember the go or roll tide. It's a thing with Alabama, I guess. I don't know. I'm not from Alabama. But in my mind, I remembered go roll tide Alabama. Those 
stuck with me. So then I remembered the GRA, GLP-1 receptor agonist, go roll tide, all the drugs end in tide. Hopefully it helps you. That was my trick for remembering those. Benefits for possible cardiovascular benefits and weight loss. And then there's contraindications here listed. All of them are re revolving around kidney function. So again, extremely important. Also to note, not just kidney function, I'm sorry. Patients with a personal or family history of medullary thyroid uh, cancer or endocrine neoplasia, also these drugs are going to be contra contraindicated with those patients. So important to know. And then your slide for your GLP-1 dosing. Next drug class is our sulfonylureas, glipizide, glimepiride, and glyburide. These ones tripped me up with the DPP-4s, but the DPP-4s, remember, roll tide, always end in tide. These ones always end in eyed, no, no T. And the way I also remembered it was sugar, I'd hate to drop. And that's because this drug class, we really have to be cautious with our hypoglycemia as well. This drug is renally excreted. So those patients with any kind of kidney disease are gonna be at a higher risk for hypoglycemia complications. For patients with um, cardiovascular disease, a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2, are gonna be your better options for those patients. This can be used as monotherapy, of course, if our metformin is contraindicated, and only in patients without cardiovascular disease. Again, if they have cardiovascular disease, all of the literature wants us to get them on a GLP-1 or SGLT-2. Um, important to, to note, though, that it, these drug this drug class is extremely cheap. It's very old, so if money and finance is an issue, something to factor in. These drugs, because they decrease blood sugar so much and the A1C so much, that it's only going to be used in patients with severe hyperglycemia. And then the literature gives you examples of how to classify severe hypoglycemia. So a fasting plasma glucose greater than 250, a random plasma glucose that consistently is greater than 300, an A1C greater than 9.5%, and then all of those are indicating that the patient has severe hyperglycemia. Of course, still we're going to only use this if insulin or a GLP-1 or whatever other drug class are unable to be used. This is kind of like a last line drug. And then important to note and important for boards, Sulfa allergies are not, not a contraindication. Emphasis on not contraindicated in using sulfonylureas. So there has not been a cross-reactivity re cross identified. Sulfa allergies, patients with those allergies, they can still take sulfonylureas. And then here is your slide on the sulfonylurea dosing. This last drug class here is our insulin. I actually just included the graph from up to date that talks about onset of action, peak, duration, all of those things. I do recommend that you're familiar with them. I wouldn't kill yourself remembering these for boards, but just have a general idea. Um, if patients are requiring insulin and if we're putting our patients on insulin, typically we'll begin with basal insulin first. It's easier to manage, more tolerable. And then if needed, we can also, of course, add on our bolus insulin. When do we add insulin? I kind of touched on it briefly in the slide before, but up to date recommends if the A1C is greater than 9%, insulin or a GLP-1, if it's not indicated, are appropriate and then ideal to add on um, treatment to metformin. And then of course, the lifestyle modifications that they're already implementing. This is just a graph that I put together for monitoring and caring for our diabetic patients what to do and when to do it. This is a really helpful tool, I feel like, in practice, but also it's gonna be important for you to review before boards. So just go ahead and look this over and get familiar with when we're doing things. Okay, and then as promised, the last slide here is my dump sheet that I made 
recapping all of the meds that we just discussed, little memory tricks for remembering the names, and then just key points, clinical pearls that you really want to have a grasp on before going in to take your nurse practitioner boards exam. I hope this is helpful to you. Like I said, go ahead and leave in, com in the comments if there's anything that you'd like to see me discuss and make a dump sheet of. I will be happy to do that for you. Like I said, it helps me too. And then if you do like what I'm doing and you want to support me, then go ahead and subscribe to the channel so I can keep making this content. As always, I wish you guys the very best. Good luck with your studying. Leave me any questions and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.